LGBTQ civil rights in Kansas City, presented by Stuart Hines and Austin Williams. Hello, Stuart. Hello. Austin, how are you? Unmute. I'm doing well. Thank you, Mark. Great. Welcome both. Uh, my name is Mark Livingood. I'm director of the Story Center at Midcon Public Library. And this year, the Story Center is partnering with the University of Missouri Extension's Community Arts Program to offer a series of programs that commemorate the Missouri Bicentennial. Called State of Stories, this series of free storytelling workshops and performances, book conversations, and humanities programs, such as tonight's, explores the history and culture of the Show Me State. Tonight's program is supported by the William T. Kemper Foundation, Commerce Bank Trustee, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, as administered by the Missouri State Library. And also joining us tonight, uh, is G.K. Callahan. Hello, G.K. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, G.K. is the County Engagement Specialist for University of Missouri Extension Community Arts Program, and he works out of the Clay County office. Uh, he'll be introducing the program and the presenters and facilitating the question and answers at the end. So take it away. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. Yes, like Mark said, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, just to reiterate, tonight we are confronting the straight state, talking about the struggles for LGBTQ civil rights in Kansas City. With us, we have Stuart Hines, the curator of special collections and archives at UMKC, and Austin Williams, the curriculum coordinator at um, the Kansas Historical Society and the director of an award-winning documentary that if you haven't seen, you must definitely check out called The Ordinance Project. Um, they will be discussing LGBT activism in our hometown of Kansas City, um, and activism really centered around the times of 1960s and 1980s. So I'm going to kick it off with Stuart Hines first. Um, just to let everyone know, if we have questions as we're going along in these presentations, please put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. We will try to answer them at the end. We should have about 15 or 20 minutes to go through the chat and answer questions, um, and I will be helping field that for everyone, okay? so. To no ado, let's give it up to Stuart. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to to be here and uh, to talk about um, to talk about this hidden aspect of Kansas City history. And I speak for Austin and my comfortable speaking for Austin and myself when I say again, thank you to all of you who are attending. And uh, a huge thanks to everyone at Midcontinent Public Library uh, uh, who has made this really, really, really easy for us to do. So uh, thanks, thanks to all of you. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and get started. So it's never been easy to be a homosexual in the United States. And in the period following the Second World War, it was particularly challenging. Um, and it, that was because uh, of a number of different reasons, uh, but it starts with the president um, who uh, led the charge, President Eisenhower, who led the charge to eliminate um, gay and lesbian employees from the federal government and uh, eliminate the possibility of hiring gays and lesbians in uh, federal employment. And so what that did was that sort of set the mood for an environment of oppression across the country. And you see really extreme um, extreme examples of that. Uh, bars getting raided all the time and people being arrested, um, uh, people being institutionalized. Um, you could be institutionalized because being gay was considered a mental, uh, a mental disease. And in those institutions, people were castrated, people were lobotomized. It was a very, very extreme um, period of oppression during the 1950s and the 1960s. And so that's when we see the formation of organizations to combat this oppression. Um, and these are the first sustained uh, gay and lesbian advocacy organizations in the US. The Mattachine Society, which forms in 1950 in Los Angeles, one incorporated, which starts in Los Angeles in 1953, and the Daughters of Belitis, the first lesbian advocacy organization, which started in San Francisco in uh, 1955. 
and these groups collectively become known uh, um, by choice as the homophile movement. And they chose that name because they wanted to extract sex from the work that they were trying to accomplish and focus on um, other issues. And by choosing a word like homophile, which means lover of the same, file meaning a lover of something like a bibliophile, who a person who loves books. Um, by choosing that name, it was a way to draw attention to the issues that they were trying to raise and also provide some anonymity. The names of these groups do the same thing. They are um, intentionally obscure in order to not draw attention to the work they were trying to achieve, again, in this really extreme, uh, uh, oppressive, extremely oppressive environment. And so these these organizations get started in these cities and then chapters get formed all across the country. And these chapters um, are communicated to by the home office um, uh, through these publications. Um, and these little magazines, and they're about the size of a Reader's Digest, these little magazines were a means of communicating to the membership of each organization, but uh, they were also the source of the beginnings of a true national movement. Because they were distributed across the country, um, people who read them could recognize others like themselves and, and feel a sense of connection and not feel so isolated. And so this newly connected community has a growing awareness of a common marginalization and oppression. And the difference being that each organization has different a different approach to to those problems and these approaches are largely conservative in nature and no particular group tends to dominate those conversations but what's important is the fact that the conversations are happening throughout the 1950s and early 1960s in large part uh, in the pages of these magazines by the mid 1960s more overt strategies are are attempted, like putting the word lesbian on the cover of your lesbian advocacy magazine, um, marching in public to protest uh, oppression of gay and lesbian people, incorporating the erotic with the political. Um, but none of these tactics really make any significant inroads to meaningful change. So by the mid 1960s, the leaders of these organizations are kind of floundering. They're trying to figure out what will work, what will increase membership in these organizations, what will affect some change, some meaningful change. And so what they decide to do is get together and have conversations among themselves um, to achieve some of those goals. And they do that in Kansas City. Um, they came to Kansas City primarily because of its central location. They're, one of the guys uh, involved in Mattachine uh, had worked in Kansas City. He was from Missouri originally. He worked for the Star and got fired on a morals charge, but um, he knew the city. He knew people here. He knew there was a scene here, and so um, that coupled with the fact that most of these organizations are on either coast and neither coast wanted to fly to the other coast, they met in the middle. Um, and again, they meet in Kansas City because there is an active scene here. There were a number of different bars that were uh, relatively safe when compared to other cities. Uh, the infamous Jewel Box over on Troost, uh, the Rail Room, which was a lesbian bar uh, down by Union Station. The Redhead uh, was over in Westport, which um, is now the Riot Room. So there was already an active and relatively safe scene. And so that made um, the leaders of these homophile uh, organizations more comfortable about coming to here. And so they did. In February of 1966, they gathered at the State Hotel, which was located on the northeast corner of 12th and Wyandotte. Um, it's that building now that houses the NAIA. Um, around 40 representatives from dif 15 different homophile organizations across the country, California, Chicago, New York, Florida, DC, um, came here and started the conversations. And it's, it's hard to emphasize that these were the Martin Luther Kings, the Gloria Steinems, the Cesar Chavez's of this particular civil rights movement. These were the people who were making things happen when it was really hard to make things happen. 
And so it's, it's, it's really impressive that the first time they ever got together face to face was in our city. And when they met, they had discussions around, um, they spent a lot of time just introducing each other and the organizations. Uh, the, the first full day and part of the second day was nothing but introductions. Um, they looked at ways to articulate public statements and then they looked at a, a means to form sort of an umbrella national organization that would facilitate more meetings like the ones, the, the one that they were having. And so they spent a lot of time looking at, you know, funding and membership and the structure of what that umbrella organization might be. And eventually um, they come up with some solutions, not here, but later on that year. And uh, it becomes uh, known as the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations. NACO. So the the results of the weekends of conversations here in Kansas City were uh, a public statement um, that centered around the accomplishments of the homophile movement, uh, the establishment of a national legal fund for people who uh, had experienced challenges, um, the possibility of a joint publication. They called a second conference to be held in San Francisco in the fall of 66. And the most concrete thing that came out of it was were plans for um, a protest on Armed Forces Day. And this was the first nationally coordinated gay and lesbian protest in United States history. And it was, um, it was in response to the military's treatment of gay and lesbian people. Um, the policy of the military was to kick out gays and lesbians, um, known gays and lesbians, and in 1966 alone, over 1,700 uh, people had been removed from the Navy. So it was clearly a big issue. And there were protests all across the United States in separate cities. Um, the image in the upper right corner is from the protests in San Francisco, where there were speeches given outside of the federal building. Los Angeles, in typical Los Angeles fashion, had a motorcade. And these box signs were on top of the cars. And the cars traveled 20 miles throughout the city. And then in Philadelphia, the public protest distributed 10,000 flyers to passersby. So for Kansas City, the most concrete thing that came out of that February weekend was, um, was initiated by this young man, Drew Schaefer. Um, Drew had been in conversation with the folks at One about starting a Kansas City chapter, but he really didn't like the lack of autonomy that that, um, that, that resulted from being uh, a chapter. And so he was in attendance at this uh, weekend conference. And immediately after the conference, he broke with one and went on to found an autonomous group, the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom, Kansas City's first gay advocacy group. And he wasted no time in getting the word out. This is a classified ad that was in the Star less than a month after, um, well, about a month after, the, after that meeting. And he received enormous support from his parents, uh, Phyllis and Robert. Uh, Phyllis was on the board of the Phoenix its entire existence. And his father, Robert, uh, was a printer by trade. And so he offered his services to his son's new organization as they produced their own newsletter following th the tradition of these other homophile groups. And you can see this excerpt from the August newsletter um, already by that time, they had all these different committees set up within, within Phoenix. And these, these news, newsletters were monthly. And that's in and of itself uh, an accomplishment. It's hard to put out a newsletter, especially every month. And it's within the pages of these publications that we see the extent of the activities of um, members of the Phoenix Society. It's really interesting. There was always a religious component to their work. Um, and so there's always monthly reporting on, on those efforts. Um, in early 1968, Phoenix members persuaded the Kansas City Metropolitan Interchurch Agency to establish a task force on homosexuality. That was just one of their achievements with this particular segment of society. Um, there was a, a, always, a, every month there was a compilation of national and world news, and this was done by Drew's mother um, under the pseudonym Estelle Graham, which points to the continuing need for anonymity in this period of oppression. Um, there was regular reporting on the local social scene. 
And as Phoenix members traveled across the country and in some cases internationally, they would report back on what the gay scene was like in those locations. And then someone or some people uh, within Phoenix um, was responsible for selling ads where it was possible. And despite the fact that ads were featured in every issue of the Phoenix newsletter from the beginning, they really never generated enough income to pay for the magazine, let alone any of the society's other activities. Um, and some of those activities centered around outreach um, in partnership with civic organizations. Surprisingly, the Phoenix Society partnered with the Health Department of Kansas City, Missouri to produce this brochure on venereal disease in 1967. And it was distributed at bars and other locations. And it was popular enough that um, they had to do a second edition in 1968. They also made inroads with the uh, local law enforcement. And again, by 1968, Phoenix was represented on the Metropolitan Police Community Relations Committee, which was a city commission designed to improve relations between metro area police departments and the city's minority communities. So it's really interesting that by making these efforts, um, they result in government officials viewing gay people as, an, as a minority. Um, Phoenix members were also regularly tapped for media statements and they appeared on the radio with, with significant frequency. Um, but publishing, um, was also Phoenix's most significant contribution to the national homophile movement. At that second planning meeting in the fall of 66, Phoenix was selected to serve as the national clearinghouse for NACO. They produced official NACO publications, they managed mailing lists, and they even produced, on top of all of that, they produced, their, um, they produced a clearinghouse newsletter that detailed the committee's activities and their processes. And so, for a nominal fee, NACO members from across the country could utilize the services of the Clearinghouse Committee to print and distribute their house publications. And these were some of the titles that were printed and, printed and distributed from Kansas City. Uh, Vector, which was uh, from a group out of San Francisco, Tangents came from a group in Los Angeles, and the Blue and the Homophile Action League came out of Philadelphia. The Clearinghouse was clearly a massive undertaking. Not only did uh, all members, all NACO members receive official NACO publications, but each member organization was supposed to receive copies of mailings from every other organization. And as NACO membership grew from less than 15 to more than 30, that becomes a logistical nightmare, particularly in an era where there's no computers. There's no computers, there's no internet. This is all done by phone and by mail. And so, it was particularly challenging and just a lot of a lot of clerical uh, overhead to make this happen. In 1968, um, Phoenix House opens. It was Kansas City's first gay and lesbian community center. And prior to the opening of Phoenix House, the society's uh, meetings were held at Drew's parents' home. Um, the Phoenix House had printing facilities in the basement on the first floor, there was a lending library, meeting space, and a hotline. Um, people could people in crisis could rent rooms on the second floor, and Drew had an apartment on the third floor. And so by 1968, there's a lot going on for Phoenix. This is just two years after that meeting at the State Hotel, and Phoenix was never really very big in terms of numbers. Um, there's no membership roles that exist, but it could not have been more than 50 or 75 people, and typical with organizations like this, it's usually a small core of membership that does all the work. And that's the case here because you see the same names over and over in the newsletters. Um, so by this point, Drew's really exhausted. And so he steps down as president and the group itself has, has really overextended itself. Um, they're trying to balance their local commitments with their national ones and money's a factor. Um, again, the advertising in the newsletter isn't generating enough revenue. The clearinghouse isn't, um, isn't paying for itself. And by taking on this house, um, th they also took on significant new costs associated with it. But Phoenix is still prominent on the national scene. Um, that same year in 1968, the NACO conference was in Chicago and a Kansas Cityan was elected president of NACO. Uh, 
And uh, at that same conference, they, um, they adopted this slogan, gay is good. And they also adopted a homosexual bill of rights. Um, now this document tended to ignore the, the concerns of the lesbian membership. And so after uh, they adopted this bill of rights, the daughters of Belitis pull themselves out of NACO. And that um, is an indicator of other tensions that are mounting within the homophile movement at large. Because by this point, a new generation of activists has come to the forefront and these younger people are, are far more vocal and way more militant in their approach to securing civil rights. Um, and not only that, they wanna broaden the scope of what the homophile movement is about. They want to include black civil rights. They want to include economic justice. They want to include um, uh, uh, the Vietnam War. And, and so this more aggressive and broad approach um, parallels exactly what happens, very interestingly, it parallels exactly what happens in the black civil rights movement. And it culminates um, inadvertently in um, the Stonewall uprising. And very briefly, Stonewall was um, three days of riots at a bar in Greenwich Village in New York City in June of 1969. And the first night of the uprising um, was spontaneous. It was in response to a raid on the bar by New York City police officers. And the second two nights were uh, a planned uprising. And um, the the thing that's important about Stonewall is that the uprising was successful in that during that spontaneous protest, they had, uh, they overpowered the cops, which nobody expected. The cops certainly didn't expect it. And the people who were uh, rioting certainly didn't expect it. And so it was a real surprise and it was a real boost to the people who advocated for this much more militant approach. You can't get much more militant than um, overpowering police officers. So um, in, in that respect, that's why Stonewall is so pivotal in this, in this timeline. Just a month after the Stonewall riots, NACO meets at the Belle Reve Hotel in Kansas City at Armour and Warwick. And it was a week long conference um, with a full agenda of programs on a variety of issues, a number of different issues. But time and again, the conversations were overtaken by the demands of these young militants. Um, despite that, some of the things do get talked about that were planned and they receive some local media coverage. But what doesn't get covered is the fact that NACO is in severe turmoil. Um, because after the Stonewall uprising, you, we see this explosion of these youth-oriented gay liberation organizations. And right there is the, just the name that they chose is enough to indicate their approach. It's not a, a, an obscured homophile movement. It is gay liberation. So that's very in your face. That's very um, assertive. And with the explosion of these groups, um, that marks the end, the beginning of the end of the homophile movement. Uh, Phoenix folded in 1970, and there was a, a NACO conference in San Francisco that same year, and at that conference, they decide to dissolve because they see the writing on the wall. And so the difference between these two pictures is five years, just five years. And it's a pretty remarkable demonstration of the uh, the intensity of the massive changes that took place within the gay and lesbian community as it struggled to find ways to secure civil rights in, in the late 1960s. Many people believe the Stonewall riots were the beginning of gay liberation, and technically they are correct. But um, the Stonewall uprising also brought to an end nearly 20 years of homophile activism. And as we have just seen, Kansas Cityans had a critical but largely hidden role in that movement, and hopefully opportunities like the one tonight help shine a light on their significant and pivotal contributions to this history. So with that, we will turn from uh, activism in the 60s to activism 20 years later in the 1980s, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Austin Williams. Thank you. 
Let me bring my screen up here. Okay, and I think that I am sharing my screen right now. So hopefully that is the case. If anyone can't see that, just let me know. Okay, so let me start off by saying uh, thank you so much to Mark and everyone at the Story Center uh, for having us here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank GK for uh, hosting tonight's discussion. And of course, a big thank you to uh, Stuart for um, that wonderful presentation. And I just wanna check something real quick that everyone can hear me. Everyone's gone dead here, so I just wanna make sure I'm live. All right. So in addition to being my uh, co-presenter uh, today, Stuart Hines is also my mentor, my collaborator, and one of my best friends. And the stories that I'll be discussing today in great part come out of research conducted at the Gay and Lesbian Archives of Mid-America which of course would not be possible without Stuart Hines. So again, thank you, Stuart. Um, in addition to this research, I've conducted roughly 25 oral histories on behalf of the Glamo Oral History Project. And if you're interested in learning more about the stories that you hear tonight, we're gonna provide a link at the end of the presentation to a documentary film that Stuart and I made together, in addition to the transcripts of some of those oral histories, in case you would like to do research yourself and learn more about the rich history of Kansas City's LGBTQ activism. So Stewart ended his presentation with this image in which we see two activists on the steps of City Hall in Kansas City, Missouri, holding a sign that says silence equals death. And this image actually comes from a, dem a demonstration held in June 1989 entitled Target City Hall. And in today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about how and why it is that LGBTQ activists came to identify City Hall as a target. We'll talk about how this uh, activism was directly linked to the American AIDS uh, epidemic and why it is that this broad coalition of LGBTQ organizations demanded, as you'll see in that flyer, that the age of invisibility was over. And as Stuart noted, the Phoenix Society along with their non-confrontational style of activism, ceased to exist by the middle of 1971. And by the mid-1970s, we see the rise of new LGBTQ organizations in Kansas City, organizations like the Women's Liberation Union and Gay Talk, which utilize periodicals and phone banks to help members of communities find resources and also to find each other. Additionally, organizations such as the newly formed local chapter of Christopher Street sought to increase the visibility of LGBTQ communities organizing the first gay pride parade in Kansas City's history. And in the background of that parade photograph, you'll see a banner for the Metropolitan Community Church, which not only provided a house of worship that was inclusive to gays and lesbians, but also a safe haven in which individuals could meet members of the community outside of the bar scene or local cruising spots. However, with this rise in visibility came pushback. Starting in 1971, local municipalities across the nation began to pass ordinances prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation in the areas of employment, housing, and public accommodations. Unfortunately, this push for civil rights triggered a new anti-gay movement, which found a spokesperson in 1977 when pop singer and Christian activist Anita Bryant started a religiously driven movement entitled Save Our Children. Now, this group used the referendum process to overturn a non-discrimination ordinance that had been passed in her home area of Dade County, Florida. So Bryant and members of the Save Our Children movement relied heavily on scare tactics and misinformation, claiming that lesbians and gay men were a direct threat to children, especially in the roles of teachers, either as immoral role models or worse as pedophiles. And in the midst of all this, Brian actually visited Kansas City in the summer of 1977 to attend a recording of Pat Robertson's show, The 700 Club, where she was met by over a hundred activists outside municipal auditorium, thanks to the organizing efforts of Christopher Street and other organizations. But nevertheless, Bryant and the Save Our Children movement, along with the contemporaneous rise of the religious right 
were successful in overturning numerous non-discrimination ordinances across the country. And it was shortly after this, so at a time when gay men and lesbians were becoming more and more vulnerable to attacks from the anti-gay movement, that newspapers across the country began reporting that doctors had discovered a perplexing new disease afflicting gay men in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. So it was actually 40 years ago this summer in 1981 that news of this rare cancer began to be reported. And it quickly became known as GRID, which stood for Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. And even as dozens and eventually hundreds of gay men in coastal cities continue to be diagnosed, it remained unclear whether gay men in the Midwest would be spared from this mysterious illness. But alas, the first case of what would go on to be labeled acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS was reported in Kansas City on October 14, 1982. And at first, Kansas City's caseload grew slowly, but that would quickly change. By late 1983, as many as 150 people in the metropolitan area were suffering from symptoms that pointed to the disorder in its developing stages and the vast overwhelming amount of those cases were from gay men. By 1985, AIDS had undeniably reached the Midwest with Kansas City leading the entire state of Missouri in the number of reported cases. And as those uh, diagnosed cases continued to rise, Kansas City's municipal government, much like the Reagan administration, struggled to formulate any sort of cohesive response to the escalating epidemic. Volunteer organizations like the Good Samaritan Project took on the responsibility of providing hospice care for those in the direst situations, although funding uh, those endeavors proved to be quite difficult. And concerned that Kansas City might be perceived as lagging behind other cities in its response to the AIDS epidemic, in late 1986, Mayor Richard Berkeley established a task force to increase public awareness of the disease and to begin educating the public about its prevention. However, others weren't waiting for the federal or local governments to take action. 1987 witnessed a surge in activism sweep across the North American continent, and the Reagan administration's failure to properly acknowledge the unfolding epidemic led to the formation of AIDS activist organizations like ACT UP, which was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And at the same time, in 1986, a Supreme Court case, Bowers v. Hardwick, upheld the constitutionality of a Georgia sodomy law, which prompted backlash and culminated in the Second National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights on October 11, 1987. And among the hundreds of thousands in attendance that day was a contingency from Kansas City who returned home from the march so inspired that they immediately formed a new organization that they called the Pink Triangle Political Coalition. And they described their group as a political vehicle working for an end to discrimination based on sexual orientation. So the new group openly welcomed bisexuals and transgender individuals into their ranks, and they targeted legislative action on the local, state, and federal levels. Now, in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, the young man you see is uh, uh, John D. Barnett. And in the early months of 1988, he was attending Pink Triangle Political Coalition meetings. And while he shared their goals, he nevertheless felt that the group's respectable tactics lacked an appropriate sense of outrage, much like the ACT UP chapters that he was seeing across the nation. So in the summer of 1988, he took out an ad in the Alternate News, a local gay periodical, asking for individuals interested in forming an activist organization to contact him and schedule a meeting. And within 30 days, members of their newly formed ACT UP chapter were out on the streets, putting flyers on cars at every gay bar in town and placing weekly ads in the multiple gay periodicals distributed in Kansas City. And on October 11th, 1988, in commemoration of the March on Washington just one year earlier, Kansas Cityans participated along with gays and lesbians in several other US states in the first ever national coming out day and members of the Pink Triangle and ACT UP were interviewed by local news agencies and informed reporters that the time had come for members of LGBTQ communities to break their silence. And on that same day, 
in what is one of the more telling examples of how Kansas Cityans capitalized on national momentum to increase local awareness, ACT UP KC gathered 30 protesters outside the Food and, uh, Food and Drug Administration building in downtown Kansas City to coincide with the national chapter's efforts to seize the FDA headquarters in Rockland, Maryland. So ACT UP members were acutely aware of the importance of grabbing the media's attention. And that evening, local news stations followed their coverage of the national demonstration with shots of AIDS activists drawing chalk outlines around the bodies of people on the streets of downtown Kansas City. And they were filled with the names of Kansas Cityans who had died from AIDS. So as we see, one strategy was to coordinate demonstrations alongside national efforts. However, the majority of ACT UP KC's early work primarily aimed to help Kansas Cityans at the local level. And in early 1989, ACT UP KC targeted Telecheck, a local company in Overland Park, Kansas, that had fired an employee named Mark Sweetland for acknowledging that he had AIDS. And with TV cameras rolling, they marched outside the headquarters of the company in Overland Park, demanding justice for Mark. However, ACT UP's activism wasn't just about AIDS discrimination. That same year, when a local Walmart employee named Michael Pointer was fired for the mere rumor that he was gay, ACT UP KC picketed his store's front entrance in what one member would later recall as the scariest demonstration I ever took part in as numerous shoppers taunted the activists with homophobic slurs and even threatened their lives. And as we can see in these two different examples, the actions of ACT UP KC confirm that the organization viewed HIV AIDS discrimination and homophobia to be two issues that were inseparably interwoven. Numerous former members have stressed to me in oral history interviews that you could not address one of those issues without first addressing the other. But throughout the closing years of the 1980s, perhaps nobody drew the ire of Kansas City AIDS and LGBTQ activists more than the local city council members. On December 31st, 1987, the mayor's task force on AIDS officially composed an executive summary recommending, among other things, the formation of a city-led AIDS council. And throughout 1988, the AIDS council held meetings and broke into subcommittees, which ACT UP KC members frequently attended demanding that there be more funding for aid services. Local volunteer agencies desperately needed these funds. And to the members of ACT UP Kansas City, the whole process just seemed overly bureaucratic and for people with AIDS, painstakingly slow. So it was in this context that on June 22nd, 1989, over 100 gay and lesbian activists gathered in protest on the steps of City Hall in Kansas City, Missouri. They were infuriated by the city government's apathetic response to the AIDS epidemic, and they claimed that it was blatant homophobia, which prevented Kansas City Council members from taking action. And speaker after speaker took to the microphone and reiterated that the age of invisibility was over. Representing ACT UP KC, co-founder John D. Barnett declared, AIDS is not, I repeat, AIDS is not a gay disease, but AIDS is a gay issue. And at the top of ACT UP KC's list of demands was the passage of an ordinance protecting both people with AIDS and gays and lesbians from discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations. They were tired of hearing about how the city had no money which could be allocated to help people with AIDS. So the activists pointed out that passage of a non-discrimination ordinance wouldn't cost the city a dime. And in response, in December of 1989, the director of the city's human relations department invited ACT UP KC to testify in front of the city council's audit and finance committee. Members John Barnett and David Weida made their case as to why an anti-discrimination ordinance was needed protecting people with HIV AIDS. But as they noted, such protections were a moot point if the city did not also include protections based upon sexual orientation. And the reasoning was basically an employer could say, oh, I'm not firing that person because they have AIDS. I'm firing them because they have AIDS and that implies that they're gay. So the city's human relations director, Mike Bates, echoed their sentiment 
And the two activists left that meeting enthused, immediately calling up members of ACT UP Kansas City in the Pink Triangle. And within two weeks, a new group was formed, the Human Rights Ordinance Project, for the sole purpose of getting the new anti-discrimination ordinance introduced and passed. The group found a strong ally in Councilwoman Catherine Shields, and together they spent months looking at similar legislation from around the country. Now, members of HROP preferred a definition of sexual orientation that was utilized by Seattle, Washington, which included transvestites and transsexuals, which today we would refer to as transgender. Shields agreed, but just days before the ordinance was to be introduced, she called an emergency meeting and informed the group that she had pulled the city council and she guaranteed that the measure could not pass unless the definition of sexual orientation was limited to one's homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality. And while the initial reaction of the members of HROP was to just pull out entirely, eventually they decided to move ahead when transgender members of the group encouraged Shields to continue without them with the understanding that their protests were going to be heard during the public testimony. And when the week came to introduce the legislation, the organization was thrilled to learn that Mayor Dick Berkeley himself would be co-sponsoring the measure. And hopes were high that the ordinance might pass through committee without much opposition. But unfortunately, Ordinance 65430 instead became one of the most contested pieces of legislation in Kansas City's history. For three weeks, over a dozen hours of public testimony was heard from hundreds of individuals. Letters flooded the council members' mailboxes, while phone zaps from both sides effectively shut down the phone lines at City Hall. And some opponents did have sympathy for people with AIDS. However, as many of them testified, this sympathy was reserved for innocent victims, such as hemophiliacs. Indeed, what clearly troubled opponents the most was the new category of sexual orientation. More than any other form of employment, opponents repeatedly pointed to the necessity of keeping homosexuals out of schools. Not only were gay teachers bad role models, they argued, several went even further and suggested that they were potential sexual predators. And while opponent after opponent rolled out the same old arguments heard over a decade earlier during Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign, what was new was the fear that was associated with HIV AIDS and its association with homosexuality. So the opposition was so fierce that when the day of the vote finally came, even the co-sponsor of the legislation, Mayor Dick Berkeley, voted to send it back to committee, essentially killing the ordinance for good. Berkeley and seven of the 12 council members agreed that it had been a mistake to try and pass both categories, HIV status and sexual orientation in the same ordinance. And indeed, Ordinance 65430 was never again called before the city council. So in May of 1990, that specific ordinance did fail. But spoiler alert, both categories did pass, although separately, and it would take over three years before sexual orientation came to be included in the city's civil rights ordinance. And as you might imagine, a lot happens in those three years, uh, far more than can be covered right now. We're talking about three years of protests and rallies and campaigns, elections, demonstrations, festivals, parades, petitions, proclamations, and referendums. But if I could summarize the transition into the 1990s very quickly, it would include the following. Throughout the rest of 1990, ACT UP Kansas City became more militant than ever, even hosting a national demonstration in Kansas City with chapters from across the country, the largest demonstration in the group's history. And local city council members were paying attention. In November of that year, the council passed an ordinance protecting individuals with HIV AIDS from discrimination. They also passed a resolution protecting city employees from discrimination based upon sexual orientation. But again, those protections were limited to just city employees. And meanwhile, the Human Rights Ordinance Project repurposed itself. They dropped the O and became the Human Rights Project, a new organization dedicated to a multitude of causes, including the screening and endorsement of candidates who were friendly to LGBTQ civil rights efforts. 
In fact, John D. Barnett himself ran for city council as the first openly gay candidate in the city's history. And although he didn't win, Barnett exceeded all expectations in the primaries, garnering 11% of the overall vote total. And the maps of the precinct voting demonstrated that Barnett's stronghold came from Kansas City's Midtown area. So thanks to this new data, activists realized that they could realistically run a state legislator in that area and potentially win. And with this information in hand, Tim Van Zant went on to become the first openly gay member ever elected to the Missouri General Assembly. Now, throughout the first year as mayor in 1991, activists repeatedly pressured Mayor Emanuel Cleaver to honor campaign promises that he had made to gay and lesbian communities. And while there was much drama surrounding this event, Mayor Cleaver became the first Kansas City mayor ever to attend an LGBTQ Pride Festival. And at that festival, he announced the formation of a commission whose sole purpose would be the collecting of information on challenges faced by gays and lesbians in Kansas City. So members of LGBTQ communities testified that they lived in fear, fear of losing their jobs and homes, fear of being harassed or beaten in the streets. And the commission came to recognize that this issue was so great, they kept an empty chair at all commission meetings to recognize those who couldn't testify out of fear of the consequences. And along with the continued pressure from LGBTQ activists, the new city council finally acknowledged the need for a non-discrimination ordinance based upon sexual orientation and passed the legislation on June 3rd, 1993. Now, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the presentation has to stop here uh, because of time constrictions. Uh, but the story, of course, never stops. Uh, many more battles, victories, and defeats continued throughout the 1990s and into the 21st century. Gender identity was not added as a protected civil rights category until 2008. And of course, these battles still continue today. And this month, for the first time in Kansas City's history, the Progress Pride flag is being flown above City Hall. The same city hall where a little over 30 years ago, LGBTQ activists illegally snuck to the top and draped a giant banner that said stop AIDS in an effort to declare that the age of invisibility was over. And with that said, I think we'll bring everybody back in and um, answer some questions. Well, I wanna start by saying thank you to both Austin and Stuart I'm going to say thank you for the audience as well, since they don't have mic capability, but that was very fascinating. Um, and I do have a few questions for you guys. So I'll kick it off with actually our first question, which I think is directed towards you, Stuart. Um, can you talk about, um, and I'm going to butcher this name, but the daughter of Billitis. Yeah, thank you. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate you trying to save me there. Um, their logo, is that an abstract image? Did it mean anything? What's it is an it is an abstract image, and they had a um, I think on that card there's a little uh, 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 Latin quotation, and I honestly can't remember what it what it um, translates as now, but um, it it just is all pointing toward that that notion of anonymity and and obscurity. Even their name, the daughters of Beletus, Beletus was a very obscure. <laughs> a very obscure figure in the poetry of Sappho, which who, who was an ancient Greek lesbian poet. She lived on the island of Lesbos. That's where the name lesbian comes from. And so um, it, it is just a, an abstract icon that, um, that uh, contributes to that effort to um, keep them out of uh, visibility. Great, thank you. And before we go on, just for everyone else still listening, um, please put your questions in the chat. I know there's also a Q&A, but try, I'm, I'm really monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, throw them in there. Um, so I, I'm gonna start with my question just because I have the floor, I guess. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the Stonewall, Stonewall riots. What about um, Compton's cafeteria um, that happened in San Francisco? Because I hear a lot of debate about this, being a West Coast individual, I'm just curious where that actually lies. I know Stonewall gets a lot of um, credit, which I'm sure it deserves. Um, 
So there were there were riots to use that term um, at Compton's. Compton's was a cafeteria that was um, friendly to trans individuals and so and street kids and those folks would gather at Compton's late in the evening typically and and just hang out and it was a diner it was a 24 hour diner so they would just hang out and eat. Um, what happened at Compton's was ownership changed and the new ownership was far less friendly to this population. And so um, there was uh, uh, an outburst um, against some perceived slights on the part of the police. And uh, so there, there was a, a, an uprising there. There was also a similar uprising at a bar in Los Angeles called the Black Cat. Um, and it was it was New Year's Eve, and the bartender kissed someone, kissed a man. The man bartender kissed another man at, at midnight, and that brought um, the undercover police out from the woodwork, and a riot ensued. The difference there are a couple of differences. The differences are that, incredibly, at the the first night of the Stonewall uprising, they really had the police. They really had control over the police. They had police barricaded in the empty bar, and they were th they were throwing Molotov cocktails into the bar. They were trying to set the bar on fire with the police in it, until um, uh, until uh, backup came, um, just in the nick of time. And other historians argue that one of the primary reasons that Stonewall is commemorated the way it is, is because a year after the riots in 1970, folks who were there um, organized a march through central Manhattan. And that was the start of pride festivals. And so despite Compton's and Black Hat and other places, um, it's because Stonewall was commemorated that it got remembered. Um, so it's really a combination of that commemoration and that success in terms of them overpowering the police because it had never happened before, either at Compton's or at Black Cat or elsewhere. Thank you. I've always wanted to know the answer to that. Um, so what kind of um, conference materials are in the GLAM collection for the, um, no, the Nacho conference? No, Nocho conference? I don't know how you say that again. NACO. Um, I'm going to just butcher things. Thank you guys for sticking with me. <laughs> there, um, there are uh, there's some good resources that have come to us from um, a, a similar archive in Connecticut from one of the um, leaders within NACO who attended every conference. And he was, um, I think he was secretary of NACO. So he kept everything and he communicated with all these other homophile organizations. So there's a lot of material from him uh, from his collection that uh, we obtained copies of for research purposes, because it's not um, glamour material. We can't, um, we can't reproduce it in any way, uh, but we can share it with on-site researchers and point them to the direction of that particular archive. Um, it, it, and to my knowledge, it's one of the best NACO collections in the country. And how did you guys come upon that collection? Just a backup question. I mean, just, sheer luck and kind of stumbling around on the internet. <laughs> so speaking about the glam archives, um, what sort of materials do you look for? Um, do you, like, what things are you attracted to in case there's listeners that might have things and maybe no pun intended, but in their closet? Um, um, <laughs> good pun. Uh, the, uh, I get that question with some frequency and, and the, uh, the answer that I give is, I don't know, what do you have? Um, because from my perspective, um, which is a little different because uh, I have a, a pretty strong sense of what's in the archive already, um, whatever it is will help contribute to the story, whether it's a matchbook, whether it's the papers of an organization, whether it's a t-shirt, whatever it might be, everything collectively helps to tell the narrative. And so um, there's really nothing too small or too big um, that can make that contribution. And if I could yeah, jump in there, Stuart, uh, when it comes to uh, having been a researcher that uses uh, Glamour's archives, um, 
it, it is very true that when people donate things, they might not think that uh, their you know particular resource that they have adds much you know to an overall narrative. But when you start putting these things together, it really does start helping to put together some stories. And my research, my whole path towards making the documentary film started as a graduate student visiting the Gay and Lesbian Archives of Mid-America. And when I started doing the oral histories with uh, individuals, they would take me into their attics and closets and basements. And a lot of the times they actually had either forgotten or didn't realize the amazing resources that they had. So yeah, definitely just uh, contacting Stuart and, uh, and just giving an overall idea of the types of things that might be sitting there. Because there, there are things like VHS tapes, for instance, that are hitting their shelf life right now that uh, is, is just the kind of thing that um, really can help illuminate a lot of stories. So while we have you talking, Austin, I have a question for you. Can you talk more about um, what are the KC measures to address trans issues today? I don't know how oh, that's, you are on the current um, that's policy. That's probably, yeah, bet, I mean, for, for actual today, that might be better for Stuart actually, as far as, I mean, I know of a couple of different organizations, but Stuart, when it, well, I think the um, the new commission that was formed in Kansas City, Missouri, I know um, that uh, uh, not a, a majority, but a significant portion of that commission is um, representing the trans community. And so I think they will, as they as they start their work, they will be looking at issues that are specific to that community, as well as incorporating um, the those community members into the discussions of larger issues. And that's really about the extent that I know of um, at this point. I, I mean, a lot of that too right now is going to end up being kind of like it was with AIDS and, and other things. When people feel like they're under attack, it's gonna be reactionary. And definitely in the status quo right now, we see gender identity as being the place where a lot of the, the new battle lines are being drawn. And so over the last few years, you have seen things like bathroom bills and a new emphasis on transgender athletes and uh, the types of things that um, it, it's gonna take, uh, you know, I mean, this is where you see the broadening of the acronym to where it's a, it's a broad coalition of people, you know, sticking together. But, but a lot of things that are gonna need to be done are probably gonna need to be done in reaction to these measures which are being passed through conservative legislatures and, and local governments. And what's really interesting that we uh, can't identify a specific organization, um, I think points to the, the change in advocacy and activism. Um, it's with, with the rise of social media and with the rise of online life, um, it's become far more distributed and not so centralized. So there's no pink triangle political coalition. Um, there's no Phoenix society that, that we can point to and say, there's the group that does this work because um, these online groups aren't nearly as visible, I don't think, as um, these more these historic groups were. But I do see someone, Stuart, that pointed out in the chat that Equality Kansas advocates for the trans community. And yeah. Definitely when it comes to, I mean, the, the current groups that exist, there's there's certainly broad advocacy. Right. Um, but regarding anything specific right now, um, that would be like a legislative type of measure. Um, the things that, unfortunately, when you're a historian, I'm often living in the 1980s and 1990s and, and not getting cut up on, on what's happening for a, a couple of months in the status quo. So I have an interesting question. I, I really, I really like this question actually. So thank you, Amy, for asking it. Um, do either one of you speakers see a relationship between the lack of response around AIDS by the government and the success of um, gay marriage and equality? I mean, do you guys see uh, any correlation there, I guess? Yeah, Stuart, can I, or- Go the, ahead. Well, the thing that would just, I mean, this is kind of a causal relationship, but I mean, one of the things that would jump out to me was the, way in which the AIDS epidemic forced people to come out of the closet, so to speak. Um, and uh, the National Coming Out Day in, in 1988, uh, the fact that that was coinciding with the rise of uh, AIDS activist organizations is not a uh, coincidence. And so as people became more visible, I think 
other things that uh, you know followed that, such as trying to do away with sodomy laws and eventually trying to get things such as civil unions and eventually gay marriage, uh, was was definitely uh, at least uh, causally related to this idea that the AIDS epidemic really just kind of forced people. Like if you look at the Kansas City local government, this was an issue, uh, gay and lesbian civil rights, that they would have been happy to probably keep kicking that can down the road. But because of HIV and AIDS, they were forced to face it head on. And so at least in that sense, I could see that there would be a relationship to what eventually came on after that. I always wonder myself, though, after doing a lot of HIV activism and work, if, you know, some of that, um, that activism has been left behind and they, they picked up things like gay, gay marriage and or, um, you know, trans rights issues or things like that. And there's less activism around HIV today in the gay community than there were when we really needed it in the 1980s, um, early 90s. Well, and I think, I mean, there's, there's a clear path at the Supreme Court level uh, that, that you can trace the transition from Bowers versus Hardwick to the decision that led to um, um, Obergefell versus what's the other one? I forget the, the decision that led to, that led to marriage. Um, but, you know, I, I, the, as far as the activism goes, I mean, AIDS was a hard sell, right? Having lived through it. It was a really hard sell, and it was it was really easy for um, people in power to ignore and let people die, and um, that's what it boiled down to. It was a life and death kind of situation, and um, when you look at an issue like marriage, it, it it seems on the surface, and this is all superficial. It's, it seems like a like a uh, an easier sell and um, just just something that that is more appealing to um, to uh, promote and to and to um, fight for. Um, so those are just off the top of my head thoughts. Yeah. And, but when you see that timeline too of some of the things that start happening from the AIDS activism and then you go into the 1990s, don't ask, don't tell. And uh, the way in which that came about in 1993, coinciding with Hawaii becoming the first state to actually legalize gay marriage. And then it gets overturned and there's a whole you know, um, timeline that, 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 that goes on from that. But, but there were these other issues that were also, I mean, so, so the military issue was something that was also coinciding with the gay marriage to where now you're being more direct with the Supreme Court in trying to um, advocate for yourself. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of different factors as far as connecting from AIDS to gay marriage. Yeah. I love your guys' knowledge base. Have you ever thought about teaching a class? <laughs> Offering this <laughs> at, <laughs> at hey, I'm UNKC? trying to get the band back together. Stuart doesn't want to do an online class, but I'm sure we're, yeah. But we well, did I, teach I, As we come back to this hybrid opening back up, maybe you should think about offering a a course and yeah. Uh, do we have any last questions from the audience? Um, those are all the questions I have in the chat. So I'll give it here a second if someone, uh, great presentation, wonderful. Thank you, you guys can read that. Well, thank you very much for the kind words in the chat. We definitely appreciate everyone tuning Absolutely. in tonight. And again, uh, Mark and the Story Center and GK, thank you for, for hosting. Uh, uh, it's been great to be a part of this. And, and Austin, you know how much I love you, uh, but Stuart, I'm really glad to meet you and I'll be on this panel. Um, I'm glad that GLAM exists. I have used um, LGBT archives in San Francisco. So, you know, for my own research and artwork. And so I just think it's a great thing that we have that in Kansas City um, and that we can, you know, keep this history alive. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Sorry, real quick, put in a plug for uh, GLAM Up. And one of the things Stuart and I are doing, uh, we are now hosting, or Glamma is hosting, the Ordnance Project on uh, Glamma's website. So if you want to watch a documentary film that can expand in much greater detail, told by the, the voices of the people who were actually involved, um, you can go to Glamma's website. In fact, if you just Google the Ordnance Project in Glamma, it'll pop up. But I, well, I, I put it in the chat earlier and I just put it in the chat now. I also, um, 
just so I can do my due diligence with the public <laughs> library. Um, we have a lovely survey evaluation. It is quite important to us. That's how we get funding to put these programs on. So if you can please click that link, fill out the short survey, we'd really, really appreciate your time. Um, and then the link to the documentary is in there as well. And just check out the Gay and Lesbian Archive in Mid-America, a wonderful place. By all means. Do you have hours when you're open? What's what's happening? Um, we're for? open by appointment this summer uh, because of staffing and COVID residue. Um, come the summer or come the fall, we'll be open back to our regular hours, 9 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Um, but just, yeah, Google Glamma, if you're interested, there's a lot of content online uh, beyond just the Ordnance Project documentary, which is enough, but there's a lot there and there's contact information there if you have questions or want to see something in particular, um, happy to help in whatever way we can. Great, and for all those listening tonight, if you enjoyed this program, there are more State of Story programs, there are more Story Center programs, and there is also a link in the chat for you to check out um, calendar upcoming events and see what we have to offer. Once again, thank you, Austin. Thank you, Stuart. Thank, thank you, everyone. Guys.